collaborative um, space rather than me talking at you. So while I'm going through some slides that I'm showing you, if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat uh, directly and we can stop if, it, if I need to slow down or speed up. Um, yeah, I'm really leaving it up to you all to tell me how interactive you want this to be. So in the meantime, um, I don't really have to talk much about uh, my accolades or backgrounds because you've already heard that. So what I am going to start off with is um, why I call myself a speculative neuroscientist. And then from there, I'm gonna kind of go into some of the theories that I have around cognition and neuroscience and its place in uh, transmedia and multidisciplinary uh, art and STEM fields. So bringing um, bench research and scientific rigor into the space of design and creation. All right, so let me start sharing my screen right now. Okay. We're good. We're online. All right. So the theater of the mind. Also, in several places of this talk, um, I pulled images from artists that I really, really love. And I'm going to start collecting uh, sort of a curated lookbook, if you will, of artists who are making incredible work. And if it weren't for social platforms, um, their work probably wouldn't be seen because of how hard it is to survive and subsist within the academy. And I think that that is also a good place for us to take the conversation to. Um, <laughs> talking about what the academy and the institution is as it relates to art created by um, creators of color, specifically Black creators, uh, Indigenous creators, uh, creators who have traditionally not had the sort of institutional support um, and grounding. Um, and I, I think that that is a conversation that needs to be had in public. So if you all are comfortable, then we can take it there. But in the meantime, um, this project is one that I'm currently working on called Ancestor Armor. And I'm only going to play a snippet of it because this is a prototype, um, but it speaks about grief and the collective mourning that we're going through. And, you know, as I said uh, earlier, maybe I didn't say it. So I, I studied science and my background is as a researcher. So everything that I do, I'm like, how can I quantify this? Can it be quantified? And if so, who is doing those quantifications? If, uh, if I want my embodied experience to be looked at and dissected, if you will, and fixed because of what we go through in this modern society of being expected to live and survive um, in an environment that wasn't meant for us, what is that doing to our bodies? So this project uh, is a collaboration with an incredible artist named Sad Noise, uh, and it was curated for a show that actually debuted in New York in November called The Black Gaze um, at the Lightbox Gallery in New York. And it's uh, looking at how we ignite and reach out and are in dialogue with our ancestors. <laughs> and as you know, right now, the COVID numbers in the United States alone have reached 500,000 um, deaths. And if you think about it, and this has also been shown, that's more people than died in World War II, World War I, and Vietnam. So we are in a, a state of collective mourning, not just in the U.S., but abroad as well, globally. We're all, we're all going through this right now. So how do we begin to talk about our grief in a public way and also begin to contextualize our grief? Thank you. 
keeping your strength and coming off your shoulders. So the piece is three minutes long. I'm just going to play you a little snippet of it. Um, but I am reciting a poem to everyone that I uh, have lost in my family, both because of directly because of COVID, but also um, just historically uh, being being immersed in the framework of loss and death. Um, as a black person in the United States, but also as a, a person who um, is very sensitive to the ways in which we are really vulnerable um, to our environmental factors uh, if we are outside of the dominant narrative of society. So if that's being aggressively targeted uh, by police, if that's not having proper access to healthcare, um, being exploited and killed slowly because the resources and funding to survive and sustain yourself in society aren't there. Um, that collective grief needs to be unworked and thought about so that it can be transmuted and ultimately um, transcended. So next, uh, and the title of that piece is called Ancestor Armor. So my family lineage, um, I'm from Louisiana, my, my family's from Louisiana. I grew up in California. And thinking about grief got me to really thinking about uh, the place that Black people have with re-engaging our roots, especially um, as we migrated out of the South, both to the West and to the East Coast. Uh, and I'm particularly in interested in history uh, from a more biological perspective, like how are we genetically um, evolving uh, as Black diasporic people in the United States and also um, when we start to think about the entire global Black diaspora, like what are some of the similarities and differences in the ways that we engage in the world, um, both from a cognitive perspective, but also from an embodied and kinesthetic perspective. So this is the beginning of a historical and familiar journey um, back to my roots. And that story is told through very different um, very different immersive medias. So the first one, this piece I just showed you is going to be um, a meditation app that you view on your phone. And then, you know, when we are out of this situation, we can go back in public, it's going to be an immersive installation. Okay, so next. Um, okay, so what is speculative neuroscience? The way that I like to define it is looking at these overarching questions of how our brains um, intersect with our modern society and using those questions to guide research pro uh, projects that could be weird and might not find their place in a more rigid structuring of what the scientific process is. And what I mean by that is that um, from the 18th and 19th century, when the scientific revolution happened, mostly in Germany, um, but that was just the sort of Western framing of science, is more so how do our brains function? Are they mechanical? Do we engage with our environment only through space and time and matter? Or are our brains immaterial? And do we engage with our environment through abstractions and feelings and intuition? And so this question has kind of plagued me since I was a kid. Like when I begin to think about how our brains work, is that the logical way of doing it? And the way that I was educated through a very Western, uh, I would say a, a Western sort of rigid framework of, of a scientific rendering versus, you know, what if you're taking a more um, African or diasporic framework of science and making it more malleable to the ways in which scientific questions are formed? All right, so that is, I don't have an answer to that. That's what my work is. It's like, how, how do we do this? How can we, how can we as, you know, and I'm assuming that everyone here is an e experimenter in some way or another. It doesn't have to be science, it could be design, it could be art, it could be craft. Whatever it is that you use to experiment with your surrounding makes you an investigator, makes you a scientist. So I'm very interested in the citizen scientists and reigniting the ways in which, uh, 
we all have the propensity and um, we can give ourselves permission to ask scientific questions and uh, engage our community and, uh, you know, sort of our space and the tools that we have access to to answer some of these more daunting questions. Um, so today, since this is kind of a short um, introduction, I'm gonna mostly focus on science, artificial consciousness, and the way that mind, time, and futurism uh, bleed into each other. All right, so this is a project that I did um, in collaboration with Hython Labs in 2016. And this was our first introduction into virtual reality and speculative design and thinking about the ways in which these technologies need to be disrupted from their onset. Um, you know, when I look at video games, which I play a lot of video games and it's like, where is the Afrofuturist game, quote unquote Afrofuturist, however you want to define that. Um, my rendering of Afrofuturism is anywhere where I see a black person that's empowered um, and is supported for being empowered rather than, uh, you know, having a lot of roadblocks or obstacles thrown in your path for being empowered. So where are those storylines? Where are the movies where a monolithic idea of blackness is maybe looked at and talked about and, and called out and named, but also where black quote unquote weirdos or black, um, you know, queer, uh, non-binary, um, disabled, if you, uh, and I don't even like to say disabled, like differently um, abled or constructed in a way that you are able to engage with your environment um, that is outside of the heteronormative framework. So where are these stories and who gets to write these stories? So this project, Neurospeculative Afrofuturism, was a way of looking at that. And so, yeah, it's VR, it's um, speculative object design. So we created these objects that talk about security, protection, and visibility of black women's bodies. So we had an earring um, that was modeled after a door knocker where you could start recording with a touch of a button. And it was really talking about and in protest to the ways in which even if black death or violence is captured on video, uh, the unreality of that situation is often brought to the forefront of like, okay, yeah, but what happened before the video was starting uh, to be recorded or what happened in the aftermath? And it's like a way of victim blaming, but also blaming black people and implicating them in their own death. Um, and then we also created a scarf that confuses computer vision algorithms. And all of these projects were in collaboration with other artists who um, broaden the scope of people who are thinking about these broader questions. All right, so I'm going to show you kind of a little snippet. If anyone's interested in viewing the full piece, you can download it on the Oculus store. And I can, after this, like post links or, you know, send them wherever you have access to them. Ooh, that didn't work how I wanted it. So let me go ahead and continue on because we're running low on time. Um, okay, so I would like to say that my creative practice is um, informed by what I like to call performative research or research in public spaces. And that is doing research um, in community spaces, uh, in churches, in hair salons, in places where you don't generally hear about a spark of genius happening. 
And so this piece, NSAF, uh, you're embodied in the body of a young Black woman, and you think you're going into a hair salon to get your hair done, but you're really going to get your brain optimized. And um, it's a reimagination of a technology that exists in neuroscience called transcranial stimulation. And the piece is uh, straddling this boundary between using a technology that is supposed to be immersive and make you feel like you're somewhere where you're really not, but because you have a headset on your face and everywhere you look, you're immersed in something that the creator wants you to see, unless you take the headset off. Um, you know, what if you have an embodied experience? And now that I think about this, so because I'm a few years removed from this project, it gives me um, the space and foresight of all of the ways in which conversations um, can come outside of your control and also uh, the ways in which things can be interpreted and misinterpreted. And really that's what happens when you're a creator and you let something out into the world, it becomes its own entity. Um, and so performance for me is when you release something out into the world and it becomes a performance, it becomes a dance, um, how can that then become restructured into a new way of looking at the world. All right, so this piece is typically shown uh, as, an, as a full installation where you put on the headset, you're in a, the hair salon, you're embodied, you go through a story, you lose your body, and then you come back into reality. But when you take the headset off, you're still in the salon. <laughs> you're in the physical salon. So it's like a double layer of immersion. And when you start to play with these tangential um, and very multi-layered levels of reality, how then can, is that impacting the plasticity of your brain? So I'm interested in virtual reality as a tool for increasing neuroplasticity. So that project also, you know, while doing that project, we partnered with um, researchers from Intel who uh, helped us design a research research framework around showing participants empowered images of Black women and embodying them in those uh, those representations of Black women. So, if you see an uh, image or a piece or a project or a video or a movie, what what have you, of a person who is outside of your um, your in group, and when I say in group, like what group are you a member of? Uh, are you, you know, Nigerian? Are you Black from uh, Louisiana? Like, what is your lived experience? And we can't use these monikers of like white and Black and Asian and, um, you know, things that are very, they give us a way of naming things, but they don't tell us the property of what we're naming. So this is a way of us getting at like all of the ways in which we can get people to broaden their imaginations um, around what blackness is and can be. So this uh, paper, ooh, hold on, I didn't mean to do that. So this, uh, this project was kind of t taken over by people who are a lot smarter than me and us and you know, in, have institutional access and it's being studied uh, as a tool of exposure and empowerment of, um, yeah, of, of, of giving people an experience that they might not necessarily have in their physical lives. All right, so next, this is a project that I'm working on called The Bird in the Mind. So uh, most of the projects that I'm doing from this point on have a direct path and relationship to some phenomenon in cognitive science or neuroscience. So a bird in the mind is a framework for storytelling um, and investigating why uh, Alzheimer's and dementia related, um, dementia related symptoms are disproportionately affecting um, black communities, specifically black women, specifically black women who are uh, from the stroke belt and that is in the South. Um, and when we look at the South, and it could be the South in the United States or the global South uh, more generally. So when this project begins to take form, I would like to look at the global South and see all of the ways in which environmental factors have left us predisposed to losing our memories and what are some ways in which we can intervene in that process. Um, and also what are memories, um, how 
does architecture and landscape impact the way that we remember and the way that we engage with space? Um, and so this project is going to be a grounding in the physicality of uh, memory um, and also like building memory palaces that look at uh, that look at how cellular memory is embodied uh, in us, especially as we work through collective trauma uh, and also how we can begin to rebuild our societies to support us rather than to kill us. All right. And so I'm not going to get into the sort of premise of this story, but it is going to be using the same sort of storytelling. Um, it's going to use storytelling in order to unwork what's happening and also use storytelling to build a research, um, a research practice. So, you know, partnering with scientists, partnering with people who are also interested in seeing the ways in which our brains are primed to uh, more fully open up and become vulnerable when we hear a story about what's happening uh, rather than asking blanketed questions, which is usually how uh, the scientific process works, especially when you're doing more anthropological research of uh, uh, which typically cognitive and neuroscience um, veers towards if you're, not in, if you're not doing like a more uh, rigid structuring of neuroscience. All right, so I'm going to end on this. And um, I posted about this on social media because it's something that I wanted to remind myself to talk about. But uh, one of the re one of the questions that has really um, that keeps me up at night is why are we in so much pain? Specifically, why are Black people in so much pain? And what I mean by that is why are we in a position where we are constantly facing our trauma? If that's through media, um, social media, now during this pandemic, um, seeing our elders disproportionately dying, uh, you know, then that question begins to answer ourselves. However, what do we do about it? Um, how can we begin to use community regenerative uh, practices, um, collaborations, um, begin to look at capitalism. Like I'm not an anti-capitalist because black people don't have capital to begin with. So how can we begin <laughs> to have these conversations and not feel like we have to um, stop them before they get real? And who facilitates these conversations? Who are the translators so that when things begin to get real and uncomfortable, these conversations aren't shut down. Um, and why? Because when you look at some of the markers for stress, um, which, you know, we think about how stress and inflammation is held in our body, which can be directly related and attributed to um, all the ways we of, in which we are forced to show up in this violent society, you can actually see markers for it. So there's a protein called C-reactive protein, which is elevated in Black women, uh, Latinx women specifically. And why is that? You know, like we literally have a marker to see that stress and trauma are killing us. So now that we've named it, how do we subvert it? What do we do about it? So that we can begin to ask um, some broader questions about our health, physical health, mental health, um, emotional and spiritual health, and then begin to uh, reintegrate into a society that is um, able to hold space for land acknowledgements or, uh, you know, like giving power back to the ways of knowing which our ancestors held um, and now are being lost to us because that knowledge isn't accessible. All right, so I'm gonna end on this picture because I really like it because it, um, you know, I, I have this up on my desktop to think about when I was a kid, why I was interested and drawn to science in the first place. And I was always curious about what was going on underneath my grandma's tion. So her tion is her head wrap, you know, like what sort of quote unquote genius did our ancestors hold and how can we access that if now they're dying, you know, like 
How do we begin to restructure and think of ourselves as ancestors, think of our earth as the only technology there is, and think about this life as the only one that we have to live, so we might as well live it to the fullest, and do that by being unafraid to take space and to show up. So thank you. I'm ending there. Yo, thank you, Ash. Um, yeah, I'm still, I'm, I'm receiving everything that you just dropped into us and at the 25 minutes that you have went through your work. Ooh, 25 minutes, look at that. <laughs> I think it's 25, <laughs> I'm, I'm estimating, but you went through so much and I, I just feel like my heart is expanding in my chest right now because you're touching on so many things that it's so relevant to what is awakening and all of us collectively. Um, but what has been like, you know, um, it has been like building up inside of us over centuries. Um, so yeah, I wanna thank you for sharing your work and your process with us. Thank um, you for having me. Yeah. And yeah, so we can get into it if there was something, cause I know I went quick, you know, I'm so used to doing like longer talks now that I'm like, Brrr. so <laughs> if we wanna root it in and, you know, work through whatever you wanna work through, we got what, 40 minutes or something. Yeah, we got time to unpack, like really to really get into it. And I mean, I know Zoom can be awkward, but essentially this is a quote unquote salon. Um, and I wanna open up the floor and share this space with everyone that is present with us today. So definitely feel free to, to share elections or to share reflections and to ask Ash um, any questions that you have. Um, I'm just here to help facilitate um, so yeah, you can use the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, there's like the raise hand tool to be called on and unmute yourself and to really, you know, provoke this. Cool. Someone's like, it's giving me a uh, Octavia Butler vibe. So what I didn't get into is that NSAF was inspired by Octavia Butler because I'm from Pasadena, California. I grew up like maybe a 10 minute walk from where Octavia Butler went to high school. You know, I look up at the same mountain ranges that she looked up at. And I was, you know, uh, luckily, lucky enough to be born in her Pasadena. And so when I was a kid, when I was learning how to read, my aunt is very into like vampire, sci-fi, et cetera. And the way she taught me how to read was that I had to read Octavia Butler to her. And if I messed up a word, we had to run laps, <laughs> you know? Yes, exactly. The Matthew Knowles complex of perfection. Uh, if you will, <laughs> you know, like you are going to learn how to read and you're going to learn how to read by reading this woman who is brilliant. And uh, yeah, that's that really ignited my love for literature. So I appreciate that uh, parallel. Yeah, you know, um, there actually was a question about like the protein that you mentioned. So supposedly there was like a glitch in the Zoom what was the protein that you had mentioned? Yeah, I locked it in there. It's called C-reactive protein. Um, and if you if you, if you look at um, diseases that are, um, you know, like, hmm, let me see. I want to say the easiest way to say this. So, like, if you have a, a condition of your immune system and you look at your C-reactive protein levels, so rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, um, you know, psoriatic arthritis, some of these like more rheumatically uh, and, um, you know, like body and nervous and immune system based conditions, your C-reactive protein is going to be elevated. And there's been a study that shows that Black women and Latinx women have elevated C-reactive proteins at a higher rate than any other uh, ethnicity. And so that's concerning because it's like, we can see that the experience of being embodied in a society that wasn't built for us is physically killing us. And what can we do to bypass that? So just kind of a little personal history. I don't really talk about this because I'm a pretty private person, but I do think it, it, this is important to disclose. So when I was in grad school studying um, to get my PhD, in molecular biology, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, like super aggressive young to the point where like I couldn't walk to my to my lab. And now 
I guess, 13, 14 years later, I don't have any symptoms. I stopped taking my medicine because I removed stress from my life. And so you at some point have to make a decision. Is it, is this stress worth your life? And if yes, then, you know, you do your little Venn diagram. So if yes, go this way. If no, go this way. If you need to stop and like, there's a, a brilliant Instagram account called the Re- the nap ministries. If you need to take a nap, take a nap, <laughs> you know, like that's it. There, are, there is a time where sometimes you have to divest from society in order to be an asset to society. And maybe that is really thinking deeply and intuitively about the work that you're doing, the work that you want to do, and whether or not the place that you are trying to fit in wants you to fit in there. And if it doesn't, then leave. <laughs> and make it you know, that's, you know, that's something that I, I want to unpack because Like, personally, I've been trying to address, like, stress in relation to what we're all going through, once again, collectively. Um, But Mal's actually has their hand up, so I want to give them the floor to speak. Hey, uh, let me turn my thing and stop being awkward. It's some reason worse. Um, I um, am, one, you touched on a lot, thank you. Um, Two, like, I'm interested in, like, the aesthetic of futurism and how... um, how oftentimes it seems to be a movement towards a sanitization from nature opposed to a more embracing and different relationship to that. I'm curious if um, you are aware of any like alternative, I don't know, futurist aesthetics opposed to what has primarily been fed to us um, for me to further look into and then also just your general thoughts on um, nature's interaction with human life as it moves towards future aesthetics for lack of better terms. I love that you asked that question because a few weeks ago, um, I was fortunate enough to to speak at Afrotechtopia. um, And just thinking about like radical futures of blackness. And I say blackness because that is my frame of reference, right? I can't speak. I can't really speak to other experiences because I haven't had them. However, I can be quote unquote empathetic to Uh, the ways in which yes we are going through a collective trauma and some of us are more equipped to deal with them because like every day of our lives is a collective trauma you see what I'm saying like every day of our lives is like things are on fire so while this pandemic is terrifying while global climate change is terrifying we've been going through this since time immemorial and so when I think about futurism, um, I don't want to have a dystopian future or a utopian future because who's building that future? If it wasn't me, if it wasn't my friends over here who I know, you know, I know what they're talking about <laughs> behind closed doors. Uh, I know how they were brought up and socialized um, to actually see people who, and I'm not saying like, I think when we get into these conversations, and this is a much deeper conversation that I don't know if I'm equipped to really get into the meat of, um, but we divorce ourselves from nature, right? We think that we have dominion over nature because that's the way that, especially like this kind of Western Christian framework has taught us that like, and man has dominion over all things, not even woman, not even, you know, like animal, like man has dominion over everything, animals, plants, flora, fauna, me, you, the building over here, um, my bank account over here, (laughs) you know, like you have dominion over everything. And so when we think we have dominion over everything, nature is smacking us across the head. That's it. saying, I've been here for billions of years. So you're going to be the one, humans are going to be the ones that aren't here. So what your futurism is going to be buildings and holographic lights and, uh, infrared lights and, uh, you know, like stainless steel? Is that the future you want to live in? I want to live in a future where I see the power of trees. You know, like sometimes I'll just walk around my neighborhood and look at trees and be like, dang, you've been, this, these are ancient beings. And they, the mycelium underneath them communicates with all the trees in the entire world. And we think the internet is great. Great, okay. <laughs> the internet isn't anything compared to mycelial networks. So how can we 
start to look at and be in relationship with nature and write that into our fiction, the ways in which Octavia Butler did, you know, if you really read like, read like Seeds of Harvest, um, you know, and think about, cause she was looking up at these, like California and not connecting all of the wildfires, the Santa Ana winds, everything, but the nature, like, look at where you are. Like, it's beautiful. Look at our landscape <laughs> in the United States and also, you know, elsewhere. Like our landscape is what's monumental, not these buildings and things that we built that are not gonna outlast us. So I hope that answer your question because I went off on a tangent, but not for nothing, I think that futurism needs to be reframed and relooked at. Um, and, you know, like I've been thinking a lot about after talks to kind of like figure out a syllabus or a list that is futurist adjacent, but also, uh, reframe Afrofuturism, indigenous futurism to include the environment and not just some sort of projection out into space and out into, you know. So I, there's actually a book and I'll end here cause I'm getting long winded, but there's a book about like Afrofuturism 2.0 called Astral Blackness. I'm trying to remember the author. I know he was a professor at Emory and I'll have to find the book. Um, but it's really reframing Afrofuturism to be more inclusive of uh, like science, physics, biology, chemistry, um, also literature, uh, art, you know, immersive technology. How, how are the aesthetics of Afrofuturism um, evolving? and becoming broader. Thank you. Sure. So I also know we, we've had like a few hands go up in the chat and then they went down. Um, I wanted to see if, if T still wanted to ask their question. Uh, hey, how's it going? Um, I'm T, <laughs> nice to you, meet you. Um, yeah, I've been thinking a lot about um, what you just said about like how how can we use the earth as like our technology? Um, and I am really interested in the internet and there's like this, I guess, um, metaphor that keeps coming up where people are like, how do we build like the internet to be more like a garden? Um, and I guess I was um, really interested to hear more about this idea that, or this question that you raised um, about divesting from these frameworks um, and like what you think we could do on a collective level um, to divest from these frameworks instead of trying to fit in them. Um, I'm thinking about that a lot in terms of like social media for sure, because I feel like you know, on one hand, as creative technologists, we get our work seen like on these social media platforms, but they're also like super toxic. Um, so like, where do we start? Oh, I agree without just like building another iteration of them, <laughs> you know? And the, the thing that I'll say is, do you remember life before social media or are you kind of, the, you know, like, without aging yourself if you don't want to, you know, do you remember a time when social media did not exist? Cause I, I remember, have a hard time doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember like the conscious effort to like log on. Like I had a desktop computer, like one in our house, like at the corner of the house and you know, like dial up. <laughs> so I at least remember like having like computer like time versus like now the computers are like being made to be almost invisible um and like do we embrace that or reject that i guess yeah so you know like i said when i first started this talk i don't like like putting my answers on you i like asking questions because i ask myself a, a roster of questions before i do anything and it's like on the one hand social media is allowing a level of visibility that rarely existed before it. And I say that with a caveat because, um, <laughs> you know, it's gonna take a lot to unwork 
the hoops and hurdles that someone like me would have had to jump through in order to be in front of you right now, right? Without social media, you know, like even now it's like, if you don't talk about certain things, uh, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, or, oh, what is my pain about being a black woman? Or, oh, how am I broke, a broke art? You know, like if you're not talking about these things, why can't I sit up here and talk about uh, deconstructing C-reactive protein and then putting, and then making a picture of it and hanging it in a gallery? Like right now, I want my work to be more adjacent to the things in which I'm capable of doing rather than my lived experience. And I think that social media uh, forces us to become visible in ways that we might not necessarily want to in order to ignite people's attention and imagination. And I'm not saying it's a bad or good thing. It's just that, can we challenge ourselves to think about alternative ways of engaging on these platforms? Because, you know, there's no going back to the way that things were, unless you want to get a flip phone. Oh, I want a flip phone. Oh, I'm going to go off social media for a month. <laughs> Those things, social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, all of them, it's already in our brains. You know, they've already been infiltrated. So now we have to change our brains in order to uninfiltrate them. And what is the alternative? What, how do you want to live? Like, do you, like, for my my long term goals are to be a mountain person and chill and woodwork, <laughs> you know. Like I want to get to the point where I don't need social media, where I don't need validation, where I don't need uh, to have visibility and likes in order to continue to do the work that I was put here to do. Um, even if one person sees it, if it's helping me to evolve on this path towards being more deeply and fully human then I want to continue to do it and I think social media tricks us to, into thinking that the only the only way uh in which you have validity to yourself is if someone else gives you that validity and I don't think that that's true thank you for that answer <laughs> yeah I think um no, I thought we had another hand up, but we have Ooh, artificial consciousness. I sure did say that and didn't talk about it. <laughs> and I didn't show you the slide. So <laughs> another thing that I'm working on, thank you so much for bringing that up because, you know, this has been kind of like a project that um, I've been working on with a lot of other people for a while. It's called AI for Africa. And it is a consortium of really um, brilliant, accomplished, uh, curious scholars from the African diaspora, both um, in the U.S., in Europe, and on the continent, where we're really we're looking at how artificial intelligence and technology, when reframed through uh, Africana uh, diasporic perspective, helps us intervene in some of the biases that are built into these systems. Um, because can we trust Google? Can we trust Twitter? Can we trust, what's the one that all the, uh, you know, I don't even want to get too political on this because, you know, Zoom, whatever, who, who, where is this recording going? It's like TikTok, you know, <laughs> who's building, who's coding these algorithms? Do you guys have Black friends? Do you have queer friends? Do you have friends who are not just at your country club or your uh, ping pong table? Like do, who are you engaging with and really hearing them? Because if you don't have a wide gamut of friends with different lived experience, I don't want you coding my technology. And if you do, if you are, then I think there needs to be a critical space in which we talk about the ways in which you're killing us. Because I don't wanna be walking down a car in a self-driving car run me over because it's not trained to see black people. I don't want a police officer uh, stopping me because of an algorithm that says I fit the description, um, you know, because it's already happening, but imagine the efficiency at which it will happen more rapidly because of technology. I don't want to be around for that. That's why I'm going to the mountains. So <laughs> because that can't happen for a while, 
while I'm in society, like, let's talk about these things. There's people who, there's especially um, an organization called Data for Black Lives. Uh, there are a lot of people, you know, at big institutions who are having these conversations internally and who are building the technology. And AI for Africa is a, a grounding force to look at artificial intelligence through a more Cosmo Ubuntu framework, uh, through a more embodied framework of how technology can't be divorced from our bodies, especially if you were in um, a black body, a body that is not part of the quote unquote dominant uh, framework of society. So that's artificial consciousness. So artificial intelligence is really, I mean, for me, our AI is not intelligent. It, it's efficient at following a set of commands, which is what an algorithm, algorithm is. Um, will our machines become conscious? I hope not. You know, I don't want my computer to start dreaming or hallucinating on me. Let's keep it in the realm of you being able to solve very complex equations more efficiently and effectively than I can uh, until our human, our human capacity, our human consciousness catches up in that we are able to see our fellow human beings for humans instead of objects. You know, with it being, um, with us discussing the topics of grief, um, and especially those who are like more vulnerable to these technologies, um, I feel like we do have to acknowledge that it has been, you know, one year since the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey. Um, and like, I feel like we need to, we need to hold face, you know, for that on this topic. I definitely agree with you. I mean, we can't, so before I was, uh, before I sort of committed to this tech art design space, um, I was working at a company, a tech adjacent company that, you know, is say what you will about being inside of a corporation or an institution. Um, it gives us a way to survive by giving us health insurance and um, a salary, right? But like when things happen, like two black unarmed black men are murdered within a few days of each other, or a young black man who was exercising in adjacent to his own neighborhood was chased and gunned down for, for exercising, or Breonna Taylor was asleep and somebody bust into her house and started shooting. Um, <laughs> It's like, you're supposed to come to work and that's, and you just, hi, no, you know, like there has to be a space for not land acknowledgement. There has to be a space for trauma acknowledgement. There has to be a space for acknowledging all of these things that come extraneous to just showing up. And, um, you know, when you feel like you're not able to do that, when you feel like you're supposed to come with a level of professionalism at every turn, some people aren't equipped to handle that. And that's okay. Like if you, if you can, if you can compartmentalize, like, God, you have a superpower. I am not that type of person, you know, like I cannot compartmentalize. It only works for so long because you know what happens when you compartmentalize for so long, then you start losing touch of reality and thinking that this is normal. And it's not normal to walk outside of your house and not know whether or not you're going to get killed or not. <laughs> And it's like, everyone thinks, oh, it's black men. No, it's not just black men. It's all of us, you know? Like if it's not, and we just have deeper layer, layers to it. And now everyone's getting a collective feeling of that. Cause you know, now COVID's like, huh, you coming out your house, are you gonna get me? You know, like now we all kind of have a purview of it, but who's dying disproportionately of COVID? So it's like all of these things coming at us from every angle and that's why it's so important that we're having conversations about mental health and, um, you know, like what the aftermath of all of this will be on our mental and physical health. Because right now, um, especially as Black people, we can't be mentally unwell in the society because that also makes you a target for being targeted. You know, if you just have a moment where you go outside and you're like, I'm enraged, I need to act on this, or uh, I'm not feeling great. And now I'm going to, I'm acting outside of, um, 
this veil of what is supposed to be respectable in society, you're a target. Are you going to call the police? Are you going to call the mental health folks to come get us? Because we're having a day where we're just tired. And so I think the conversation around technology um, and the ways in which these, I don't even want diversity and inclusion in uh, corporate spaces is just uh, a veil like that. There's what's there, <laughs> you know, what I want to see, where is your numbers? Where is your metrics? Cause I don't see no movement. Uh, yeah. You're hiring more folks of color, but what's happening to uh, their lived experience inside of your institution? Are they banging their heads against the walls because of the microaggressions they have to deal with day to day? And if so, then you haven't moved the needle at all. Um, and so show, I wanna see the numbers since we're such an ROI and metrics driven society now because of algorithms, we gotta see the data. I wanna see the data to where this is working. If it's not working, then you guys need to do something else. That's it, my rant's over. <laughs> no, no, I felt every, every bit of it. I'm sure the rest of the room did too, you know? Um, Especially like, you know, in response to like, what if I just can't hold the veil together? I can't, I can't put it on today, you know? Um, or, yeah, the veil. Which is, yeah, which is like it's a like lot. Of to me, this is a veil, you know, because you could turn it on and turn it off. It's like code switching. It's like, I can let you see what I want you to see or what I don't want you to see. And sometimes that has to be, that is... <laughs> And this is getting into some of the broader questions of neuroscience that I want to look at. Like, what is the neuroscience of code switching or the juke? You know, like when you're watching, I don't even like football, but I do like this analogy of like when you see somebody about to run into the end zone and they just like start side swiping people. How, how, how are you so in flow state that you can anticipate the movement of somebody and then go the opposite direction? And I think that People who have been suppressed are masters of the juke, are masters of the sidestep, are masters of the code switch, are masters of the reformation. Uh, of, yeah, and it, maybe it is survival instincts, but how can we recontextualize that so it doesn't depress us? Like I'm, you know, I love this ability, you know, like going into beast mode. Uh, and, but how can, how, how do we go into beast mode as a united society in order to intervene in uh, global climate change? You know, so if you're suppressing me, then we can't use these code switching and juking and improvisational abilities in order to figure out what really needs to be done to impact some of these larger questions. If you can't see the humanity in people who are outside of your in-group who aren't voting for Trump, who aren't uh, you know, walking around with guns on their hips and shooting people when you walk down the street because you're trying to infringe on liberty, then how are we going to impact the earth? It's not going to happen. So you figure it out yourself because, we, you know, we're going to be over here. And then when you, you know, when it gets so bad, which we're at a point where it's so bad, we are going to have to figure out ways in which to work together and impact and, um, you know, like, and I don't have the answers to this because it's like, the more you think about, uh, you, the more you think about privilege and uh, bias and just like, I guess, fundamental hatred. And I don't wanna say tribalism because like now that language is changing, but the ways in which we kind of sequester ourselves amongst ourselves when we feel uncomfortable, how can we get beyond that uh, in order to see that like all flourishing is mutual. And there's this book, what's the name of that book? Braiding Sweetgrass. You know, like if you look at nature, you see weeds popping up in your garden. Yeah, some weeds are gonna strangle out others, but there's a menagerie of things coexisting. How do we coexist and not strangle each other in the process to uh, repopulating our planet with, uh, the sort of natural technology that's going to keep us alive, keep us oxygenated. On that note, there are some things that have been, the chat is active, it's live. I, I like this question about fetishizing trauma because I've yeah. thought a lot about this. What is our responsibility to our trauma? Do we have, is that victim blaming? 
will I get canceled for saying, you know, <laughs> there are certain things where I, when I start to think about it, it's, it's like, if I say this, am I going to get canceled? Do I care if I get canceled? Because I think a lot of conversations around cancel culture and, and calling out, calling in, we're, we're finally being, we're finally able to move past it um, and unpack it. But there's also some things where it's like, I'm saying this because I've thought enough about it where I have the courage to say this publicly, publicly, and anyone who it resonates with can take it and think about it some more. Anyone that it doesn't, it wasn't for you anyway. So go ahead. You can, I'm fine with people hating me and I'm fine with being a martyr to uh, being canceled because I think that when you start, uh, when you cut off conversations, how do we move past them? Like we already know we're traumatized. We already know, like, I already know that. I don't want to, you know, I've been thinking about it too much. I want to think about something else. I want to think about, okay, yeah, I'm traumatized. How, what do I do about it? Do I write in my journal? Do I listen to music? Do I run a lap? Do I take up archery? Do I swim? What, you know, like what are some practical ways in which I exist in society uh, without having to unwork and rehash my trauma? And right now, the only way in which we can engage in the institution is by unhashing our trauma and unpacking it for people who feel like they've never experienced it before. Oh, what does it feel like to you? I think you like, think about the worst experience that you've had <laughs> and that's how it feels every day. So can you, is that some, is that a, a way of framing it that you can understand? So let's talk about something else. Now that we've named that, uh, let's move on to something that's more, uh, that's more, and yes, some people are there, some people are not there yet. If you are only beginning to understand your trauma, don't hop from point A to point M. <laughs> you know, you gotta go through the steps. Uh, if, if therapy is your mode of, you know, if you like talking through things without having someone say, oh yeah, me too, then go to therapy. If you like uh, going on hikes and touching trees and burying your feet in the dirt the, the, the uh, you know, uh, sands and convening with nature, do that. You, it, it's individual. No one has the answer for you, but what it's going to take is you understanding and truly knowing yourself enough to know that the power is inside of you to have the type of embodied experience that you want. I think like in response to that. Ooh, plasticity is power. Can somebody make a teacher with that? I love that. <laughs> yeah, I had so many, I had so many questions, like just in case like there were any awkward silences about like how do we increase our neuroplasticity? Um, and like, but these are we That's might have... my, I'm actually working on a book about that. Um Okay, we'll keep that a Yeah, writing a book. So you know, so also, I, I don't have, like I said, I don't have the answers. I've been in, in the institution. I've been adjacent to the institution. Now I'm outside of the institution. Now I'm like, actually, you know what? I'm gonna go back into the institution. However, I'm gonna go back in medical school because that is where uh, I think that I can have the most impact. And so it's a constant negotiation with yourself. If something's not working over here, it is okay for you to pivot. And that's what plasticity is. It's like your brain is hardwired and equipped to learn and to adapt. And right now we are adaptable creatures, okay? <laughs> and so once you, once you understand your responsibility to your trauma and you hold it and you cradle it and you create a garden or a memorial out of it, however you need to do that, if that's through art, if it's through writing. It's, and I only say that because we are in a design space. If it's, you know, collaborating on a project, whatever you need to do to unpack your pain and trauma so that your brain, brain can become, or can remain plastic. And our brains remain plastic well into our 70s and 80s. Um, you know, you have many lives to live. So, you know, do it up. Don't let as much as you can. And this is, you know, take it or leave it as much as you can. Try to do things that bring you joy, even if they don't bring capital because the capital will come. And right now we're at a place where we can rethink capital um, in that either we get a lot of it because there's more than enough to go around or we just do away with it in general and do a whole like Bernie man situation. <laughs> but, in <con> but in Ghana. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like why not actually I think there exists I forget the name of it but there's like a whole festival where it's like what are alternative ways of being how do we do we barter 
that's been done before. Do I make uh do I make tools and give them to you and let you borrow them? Do I give you oranges off my orange tree so you can eat and leave them on the front yard? Like how do we actually participate in a society that is regenerative and community oriented rather than individualistic and capital oriented um, and like driven by the invisible hand of the economy because it's bullshit. You know, I we are at time and I hate to have to wrap up. And I think maybe like on a closing note, I could pose a question to you about what do you do to enter into this space too? think about alternate realities, to think about alternative solutions to, to what we are currently up against. What helps you get into that state of mind um, where you can be plastic and remold your way of thinking and existing? If you would ask me a few years ago, I would have a totally different answer, but the more that I, um, you know, the more that I engage within this space and like saying I'm leaving and then it's like no but actually I have this one last thing that I want to do first you know it's <laughs> getting to that point of being fed up but also realizing that this needs to be done so something will work out uh you just have you who you know okay so my first love is literature and I think about you know you think about the sort of uh coincident driven uh modes of the way the universe works the fact that Toni Morrison, Audre Lorde, who else? Uh, Nina Simone, they're all Pisces and they were all born around the same time as each other. And, you know, like there were a few days on my social media where it's like, you know, this was Audre Lorde's birthday. This was Toni Morrison's birthday. Toni Morrison said, if there's something that you want to read and it hasn't been written, you have a responsibility to write it. And I, you know, that's like ad living because it probably was some sort of way around that but it's basically that if there's something that I want to exist and I don't see it then I have a responsibility for myself just because I'm interested in it to make try to figure out how to make that happen if I don't have any money then I'll write it because all I need is a a napkin and a pencil (laughs) or my notebook and then once I write it maybe I can hand it off uh to someone who does have money (laughs) or I can try to write grants myself which that process you know, it's like long-term. However, it does give you access to institutions without having to insert yourself uh, fully in it. And, you know, this is more, this is more like logistics, which I love talking about. Like, I really want to do a course on the finance of being an artist because, um, you know, how to, especially a black artist, like, is this sustainable? Really? Do you really, is this what you want to do? Yes, we need to do it. There's no question. So, however, uh, maybe it is that you need to sit on YouTube and figure out how to do, um, you know, how to use Maya <laughs> or how to make, um, how to use Unity and make your own game. Uh, maybe you need to make music. Something like there have there have been so many people that have nothing that have created something, and it's like, how do you create something out of nothing? But also, how do you create? nothing out of something like how do we get away from materialism in general and how can how does materialism also implicated in art um i don't know that's probably at, that's probably like presenting 10 more questions and answering them but yeah the finance of being an artist that's something to google because there are levels to it grants uh at the end of the year in December, asking organizations, how much money you got on your balance sheet? Do you wanna see something by a black creator? Then how do we make this collaboration happen? Uh, If you're in the university, if you're in school right now, you're paying tuition, (laughs) make all that, make everything that you wanna happen, happen. If your advisor doesn't agree with it, understand it, resonate with it, okay, whatever, you know, as long as you get your degree, however you have to do that, then leave <laughs> and then make that into a bigger project once you do, once you have that piece of paper. Like, you know, my cousin is in a, in a neuroscience PhD program right now at Wesleyan. And, you know, it's like we're doing, we're jumping into these hurdles and across these hurdles and hoops and ducking and diving uh, because we think that in education and institutional access is going to help us and we see that it really hasn't. However, don't leave in the sense that like 
you leave before you finish your degree because that paper, unfortunately for us still matters. However, use the institution to your advantage while you have access to it. You're really dropping gems right now. Like, and that's why, that's why I have to go to medical school because once I say the gym, it's just like people are going to keep me out and I'll just <laughs> you know, <laughs> not, you need to talk about it. We have, I'm not one of these people who's like, um, I'm so afraid. I'm so protective of my position within these spaces that I'm not going to tell you how it really is. I think that is what has hurt us kept us thinking that it can only be a few of us that's why I don't listen mm-hmm. to this day it's not too many of us in here it, it, it needs to be all of us because exactly you know these policies are being written about us I read this uh, article called no humans involved about aggressive policing in LA in the 90s that's what we used to be labeled as no humans involved you're gonna see my humanity and you're gonna see you know, because if you don't see my humanity, then I'm the one that ends up dead. That's the, you know, end of the question. I don't even know how to wrap this up because we could keep, we could keep going and the chat is still live, but you know. You know what I really want to do though? Like how do we capture a transcript of this chat? Because it's, yeah, it's lit. I want to think about some of these things more slowly. So I have another talk coming up and like, it will be nice to, you know what I also like about, so I love uh, learning. I love taking classes, that sort of thing, but I like them to be adaptive. Like if we, if something comes up in one class, I don't want you to just move on with your lesson plan. I want you to address the things that came up and then adapt your lesson plan based on those things. Look at this, say chat. I love it. May I ask a question? 100%. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned about your one project, A Bird in the Mine or of the Mine? In the Mine. Mm-hmm. And the question you posed was like, what is memory? And I kind of want you to touch on that without going too deeply into your... <laughs> Because I'm thinking more specifically, I had a conversation with my sister the other day and we were talking about dreams. Um, And I was like, it's really weird how if I don't write down my dream, I'll never remember it again. But if I write it down, I'll be able to recall it for days to come. Um, Oh, 1000%. You know what's funny? That's because we went as as a species from an oral tradition to a written tradition. So my mother, uh, has like these full out conversations with people in her dream. And like I said, I'm from Louisiana. So I come from a long line of like voodoo adjacent people. However, when that sort of tradition branched off into Christianity, now people don't want to recognize uh, the like voodoo and more spiritual traditions of um, divination, uh, especially like thinking about how our ancestral lineage is still accessible and available to us. So when we think about memory, it's like remembering. You know, like you, when you think about deja vu, you're like, this has happened before, oh shit. You know, like that's the same thing with memory and the process, and this is like, I'm gonna, I'm not even gonna talk about a work, working scientific definition of memory because I think we can kind of all infer what that is. But when we think about the process in which memory happens and like how our brains latch onto information and the process of pruning, Um, our synapses so like the connection between neurons that is a process that has to happen like there has to be not only um you know strengthening synaptic connections but there has to be a process of removing memories that don't serve us and so we have to get better at like figuring out how to get out of the loop of memory especially when that memory is a traumatic one and I think that you know, like our, especially the matrilineal lineage of our families have had to deal with so much collective trauma and hold on to the trauma for their children, for their husband, especially their sons, for being domestic workers and having to hold on to the trauma of the people that they're doing the domestic work for. Like what, you know, like sometimes you're just like, I can't do it anymore. So is that causing the process of memory in our brains to more quickly unravel if you 
if you are a black woman, if you're from this part, this like particular uh, stroke belt in the South where people are uh, presenting with Alzheimer's uh, symptoms more, uh, you know, more fully than anywhere else. Ooh, hold up. I had to stop for a minute because somebody said, I do not agree with trauma, that trauma can be stored in DNA and passed down. Hmm. Okay. Uh, when I think, when I hear that question, um, I think about like sitting in a science class and then, uh, you know, having someone read off a board and tell me this is the way that it is. And then like years later, you come to find out, oh, that wasn't the way that it is. So I think that's very interesting to think that um, trauma can't be stored and passed down. However, if you look at epigenetics, <laughs> the ways in which that our DNA is rearranged, uh, retranscribed, retranslated and impacted by our environments. And just like using myself as an example, if I remove myself from a traumatic environment, a gene, a disorder that has been expressed in my DNA I can change that physically. Can I see? Can I see the genetic results of that? Um, can we impact ourselves on a cellular level through changing our environment and the ways and the things that we put into our bodies? Like, do we think that? Um. Hi, I'm Yanisha. I meant that your DNA, in your DNA, the trauma as a black woman, as slavery, I was saying that it is passed down, like it's evidence, is it's, it's, it's basically uh -huh. it's at our core, you really, know what I'm saying? But I wanted to bring it up because I think that there are a lot of people right. who don't think that it's passed down right, not, genetically. And we see that it is. Right, you know? it like, is, yes. We can put- And I see stop. people in the chat, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I've been talking to you. No, me. I see people, like you said, we need to be represented, represented in like the DNA or like in the AI or in like different data. So like, I don't want to say, I don't want to discourage what people are saying, but they don't understand. Like you can never say, okay, it's not like that. But as a black person, it's different. Like black people, we empathize with other people, but then it's at the same time, can you empathize with us? Because we've been through so much. We're we always caring. We're always open, in to, open to people. But then people are like, well, no, it's not that. It's not that. But you can't, you can't sit here and keep saying that it's not, but it is, you know? You know, just, yes, I agree with you. I don't think so. <laughs> I think that we've been programmed and conditioned and socialized to think that Black people don't experience pain. So when you look at, yes. when you look at, like, I just watched Henrietta Lacks. So I, you know, I went to straight up a biology program where I'm like sitting here pipetting, injecting mice, the whole nine yard bench research, like not even like, uh, you know, working with patients. And when I think about the fact that I was working with Gila cells, Henrietta Lacks cells, and then I found the history of this woman, not in graduate school, not in undergraduate school, not when I, you know, when the molecular biology, um, you know, uh, course and syllabus was being inserted into my brain. At no point did I learn that this Black woman's cells uh, uh, were stolen from her and her family didn't see a dime from it until, you know, somebody wrote the book about it. And it's like, there is a big problem there because all of modern biological science was built on the black back of this black woman and her family's still struggling. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that, if an entire institution, if an entire department, if an entire branch of science is built on your biomedical, biotechnological, uh, I don't know how, intellectual property, maybe that's a good way of defining it because that is her, even if she's dead, that's her family's cells. <laughs> You didn't pay us for those cells. You didn't even tell us those cells existed. And it doesn't matter if you discovered they existed, that's still our cells and our property. You know, like we need to be able to have these deeper, more complex conversations about ownership when it's subjugating the very people that are progressing a field. And I think about that often when we talk about content on platforms such as Twitter, uh, Instagram, um, who's controlling the wave, of uh, 
the way that society is evolving. Um, and yeah, like very often black people set the wave. Our brains are wave states, are the ways in which we've been forced to exist in society because of having to code switch and uh, make something out of nothing because it's interesting really shows you the direction in which things are evolving and the ways in which society is going. However, you have to realize that when you're trying to kill the very thing that is also helping society progress, then that's why we're at a standstill. I, um, so earlier you mentioned about like being, not being anti-capitalist because black people don't have capital, but I wanted to state the social capital that black people um, hmm have in this world um how everything that we do is trendy is something to catch on to um how we make the how people in like gen z are like yeah gen z slang is new and improved but it's really just african vernacular english um and other ways that how black people constantly show up in um society, but nameless, faceless, et cetera. That's it. <laughs> That's what I wanted to say. I agree. With, you know what? And I wish we could eat social capital <laughs> because I would right. be having steak, lobster, but I'm vegan. So I will be having the most <laughs> gourmet vegetable meals that you could ever have because if we could eat social capital, there's no question to the fact that we would be thriving in society, but we can't unfortunately and you know like if you look at the history of money money wasn't a thing in ancient societies it's just like who made this <laughs> and and then we can get really philosophical and like i love woo woo that's me you know at the end of the day if there was a, a a career that merged the immaterial kind of like feeling and quote unquote woo woo-ness of the universe and our place in it and the hard scientific facts like I'm there and really physics is the only thing that kind of like gets into that but you know math that kind of math is just like ridiculous <laughs> so when you like when you begin to think about social capital and its immateriality you know like because the people who have structured society only want to quantify and categorize and name things that you can directly measure and see. That's why we're in this problem because a lot of things, especially in physics, the matter of the universe, you can't measure it and see, you can't measure and, and see wave states uh, at the same time, like electrons change wave states when you observe them. So are there things that we can't observe and quantify that are true? And why can't we have these conversations at the level of the institution without them, without <laughs> quote unquote them like who's them but without um being shut down because you can't measure something so when can science and especially our brains because that's what I'm mostly interested in is like what is the definition uh of the boundary between mind and brain um you know what has executive function is it the, mo the molecular processes that uh drive our brain's functions or is it the mind you know like the act and the physical knowing that we are alive and we you know like we're the only species that is both aware that we are alive and we are aware that we are uh an infinite being like a, a finite being sorry you know we have at some point we are all going to die However, when we die, if matter cannot be created or destroyed, what happens to our matter? What happens to our cells? What happens to the carbon that makes up our body? It still exists. So you're trying to tell me that if these things that still exist, you said it yourself, you know, like your, your uh, deities of science, which are all mostly German men, said this. So now that I say it, it's something different. So like, how do we, can we grapple with our dead? Can we have a conversation? You know, I often think about this. When, at what point do we get over grief and we say, actually, I have a bone to pick with you. <laughs> you know, you might not be here anymore, but I'm going to grapple with your scholarship and show you all the ways in which that it needs to be modified for the society that we live in today. Like the constitution, like, why are we still, you know, like 
following a constitution that was written by people who didn't want to see us alive. <laughs> you know, I don't care about the Supreme Court and the Constitution if it's going to kill me. What does that mean? Yeah, that's real. Um, I know we. Oh, somebody disagrees about the Constitution. Let's get into it. Yeah, my, uh, my, uh, my point is that the Constitution, and as flawed as may be, or the people who wrote it and everything. However, they put in the key to What's emancipation. The key? the key is that all humans are born with inalienable rights. All. But who it, has inalienable rights? No, no. Who uh, listen, listen the, there is a process through which that franchise increases. But the main ingredient, which is there, it is. So, so, so we should be. We should be careful not to throw the baby with the bathwater. It, 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 uh, like the fact that these people that we claim, oh, they were slaveholders, oh, they were racist, that they put such a sentence in the founding document that tells you that they had something good going. Uh, going. And also it's, it's very easy for us ex post facto to, to make judgments about a, a, an era which operated on a completely different mindset. I think that's that's a little bit. Can I okay. ask you a question? Yeah. Are you a barrister? Um, am I a barrister? No, I could be one. I I, I can challenge any barrister, but. Uh, oh, but, but, but I'm not. I'm not. You, I'm, are you Are you an attorney? No, not not uh, not formally. No. Do you study constitutional law? Uh, yes, profusely. In what way? In the, in the academy? Yes, yes. And who are our founding fathers? No, let's say George Washington. George Washington, who else? You know, John Adams, uh, you know, Thomas Jefferson, you know, all, you know, all, 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 all the people that, uh, that, that wrote it. But, but what I'm trying to tell you is who that... Who are our founding mothers? Hmm? Who are our founding mothers? Mother and father, there's no such distinction. How is like, it like, like, mother and father okay. making a I'm, gender society? I'm sorry, I wanted to mute Yana's because... Um, I, you know, this is these are the kinds, types of conversations we have to have because we have to start unworking them. It's like, you you say a blanketed statement of you don't agree about what I'm saying about the Constitution. That's great. You're entitled to your own opinion. However, I stand by what I said. And you just right. named who our founding fathers are. Thomas Jefferson... Who, what's her name? Sally Hemming, Sarah Hemming. Who was this uh, enslaved woman, beautiful woman, who he has children for? He got all kinds of black. There we go. Sarah, uh, Sally Hemming. No, oh, yeah. Giannis, 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 can you wait a you second? You know, like, let's. How do you, I don't, how do you have uh, your name wrong? No, Giannis, you need to wait. You weren't in queue to speak, so please stay muted. So um, this is Kata Yoon. I, I feel like I'm circling back on a topic and I think that Ashley has a good point. If, if she wants to engage with Giannis, that's totally fine. I like um, I, I just wanted to say um, a couple of things about the, the epigenetics and the, and the inheritance of trauma. Um, there are a number of critical race scholars who argue that to place emphasis on inherited trauma is perhaps doing um, damage. And, and I'm the first to say, you know, there are tons of animal models that show that trauma is inherited. And I would agree that I think trauma can, can be inherited as an epigenetic mark. But I think the reason why those critical race scholars like Dorothy Roberts say that is because it takes attention away from the current moment. And the current moment is discriminatory, is harmful, is stressful. And so even if the trauma wasn't inherited, the trauma is happening right now all the time. And so some of the arguments that people raise, and I think this is really important, is that we need to address the trauma and stresses that are happening now. And so um, some would say that if you, if you focus too much on the inherited trauma, that you're in a sense calling anyone who has inherited trauma as suffering from a disease. And so it pathologizes the trauma in a way that's not um, 
is not necessarily helpful to solving the solution in the moment. So again, not to, I'm not in any way arguing against inherited trauma. I'm a big fan. I, mean, I, don't know, I, I, I believe in it. I don't know if you can argue against inherited trauma because yeah. the act of saying that it is there makes yeah. it possible. And I agree with you that we can't focus. There has to be, listen, when we talk about you can't do this, especially in the academy, like we're so specialized, right? If you're specializing over here, then you need to create a bridge for me understanding the ways in which I can move beyond know yeah. that my trauma is inherited. And actually, you know, this book right here, I don't know if you guys can see it. It's called Molecular Feminism. Woo! Let me get yeah. off the background for a second. So, oh, music. Okay, so when we think about how trauma is inherited, that's one thing, right? There needs to be people that are looking at it, naming it, maybe. What's that gonna do though? Is that, is dissecting the thing helping us understand its properties? If not, is there a validity in doing it? And I think- Right, that- no, I, and I'm in, I'm in agreement with that. I think what I what I was trying to raise was some of the criticism around it and for, for for people to understand why that criticism exists, which is that it, it comes from a history of what is called dysgenics or medical eugenics, which is if you start to name it as a problem that's inherited, then some people will assume it cannot be reversed. How do we get and then renaming it? Right. So, so to focus on the, the, the patterning that's happening right now would sort of allow the stress and the epigenetics to be addressed, but to address it in the current moment with Okay, with let's, bring it, let's bring it into the community now. How do, yeah. what, so I like to think of myself as sort of like a bridge between what I see going on down the street from my neighborhood, my community, because oftentimes things that are just becoming visible to people who don't have access to the institution. Like it's like light bulb. Oh my God. Like the connection is being made. However, if the institution is telling me, but you can't, but you shouldn't do that because then it's, you know, it's keeping you in a victim mentality, you know, like we have to be able to hold both. And that's what, that's what it is with complexity and this sort of dichotomous thinking. We have to be able to hold both truths in our mind at the same time in order to move past it. And like, I'm not getting into the phenomenology of like intelligence or whatever, but I do think that there's different levels of intelligence. Some of us are more intellectual, like book, you know, smart. Some of us are more kinesthetically intelligent. Some of us, you know, have the gift of gap. How are we working towards our collective personhood uh, rather than getting into these fruitless arguments in the academy? And I think those arguments need to happen by people who like that sort of thing. But this forum is like, yes, and, instead of, but, (laughs) X, Y, Z. So I thank you for bringing that up. And I also think there needs to be a syllabus and an unpacking of of womanist theory, Um, you know, that people who are in Africana studies feminist studies which I think needs to be reframed as womanist studies because feminism really kind of like um makes invisible a lot of the things that actual you know femme embodied quote-unquote femme embodied people go through and now like let's add gender studies to it because right now you know it's like maybe I don't feel like a quote-unquote woman today I feel like Ash who is ready to show up in a different form as maybe an avatar or something like that. So it's like, how do we, how can we, how do we do that? How, what, what is the forum? And, and also engaging with uncomfortable conversations. Like, I like it, you know, like, yes, disagree with me. Cause then we, let's go toe to toe. Like you do in, maybe not in court. Cause I don't like the antagonism of it. Let's ask questions to get it in to get at what's underlying that. Like I had a dear friend who I went to grad school with. I had to, you know, I was doing a talk about blackness of some sort. I don't know what I was talking about, but he came into my DMs and said that he felt like he couldn't be my friend or engage with me anymore because I was talking about black people too much. And it's like, when did you realize I was black? (laughs) You know, like how, why is this something that we even have to talk about? Like we have 13 years of history and this is the first time you're realizing that these are things that I think about every day so okay that's problem that's a problem 
can you see my humanity? Can we be friends? You know, just brought up all these things. And all I said was like, let's have happy hour. Oh yeah. Oh my God. Let's catch up. Like, no, we have to be able to engage with all facets of me, not just the, the facets that make you comfortable. And I think that we have to, even if we don't agree with somebody, even if they try, you know, like I was in Texas one day and somebody had a Trump hat on and he saw my, what did I have? Maybe it was my crossbow or something like that or my knife you know like I'm outdoors I love woodsy things and it was like oh my god that knife is amazing it's like we had a common ground and it's like you probably hate me until you see me and see that we have a common interest and how many of these moments of common interest do we have to have for you to fully see my humanity without me having to talk about trauma all the time What time is this class? I feel like we could go on all day. We we have been. We've been going, you know. <laughs> and I didn't want to disrupt the flow because I feel like these are topics that we need to discuss. These are things we need to get into. Um, and it's we don't have these conversations enough in these types of spaces. Um, but you know, at the same time, I do want to be respectful of Ash and Ash's time. So Especially like going back to what is capital? Um, <laughs> what is it? Right? I mean, time is it. How do we not need it? <laughs> How do we release this control of our lives? You know, and I mean, like as we're, you know, trying to find a way to, to wrap up when it's difficult to wrap up these ongoing situations and conversations um, that are still pre present, but, um, I guess in regards to time and capital um, and value, like I wanna make sure, and I'm sure we wanna make sure that, you know, your time spent here is of value to you, you know? And even like elaborating on how like you were gonna say, this was like probably the last time you're gonna have a, a conversation or a dialogue like this in this type of space because it is emotionally taxing, you know? Um, it's, it's a lot of work for us to unpack and unroot and be vulnerable in, in a space that's just not fully, um, you know, black, point blank. Um, yeah, this is, I, you know, I, I wasn't going to go this deep, especially because sometimes I feel like I have to protect myself in my quote unquote career. And sometimes getting too real or, or, or orienting yourself around a truth and being able to name it sometimes like it does it makes you vulnerable but I have been in enough spaces where it's like I want somebody to make that wave state and like get real like tell me how you're struggling uh don't make it seem like once you got into this position or this space that it just solved all the problems uh, right you once you publish in these peer-reviewed journals that it solved all the problems like it didn't however you now have a platform to help other people think more in depth. And I don't want to say critically, because what is criticality anyway? And like, is there a point at which criticality uh, actually puts too many hoops and hurdles and bureaucracy in our path rather than solving them? And I think that's, you know, what the conversation is gearing towards pathologizing something rather than, I don't know, even solution-based sounds like to me like violence because like especially right now like if all you can do is lie in the bed hey you know at least you're alive <laughs> you know like there are some days where it's like dang at least I am here um but what happens when you do have the energy and like how can we get more in tune with the circadian rhythm of our bodies to listen to when we have the energy to engage more critically and fully versus where sometimes you know I literally just want to talk about you know how certain songs and music uh maps onto our 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 brain waves you know our theta waves like how do I say like maybe I don't want to talk about uh you know <laughs> how the microaggressions have caused me to take SSR you know like just getting real like oh this is my reality you know like you don't want to be confronted with that so you know at what point does it become too unprofessional too real and how do we, like, how do we engage with that um, in, in the workplace? 
Yeah, in this very space. Cool. Well, also my DMs and my email are open. It might take me a minute to <laughs> get to everything, but I am, if you have a question, I don't mind answering it. So that's it. Well, yeah, y'all hit up. I have to answer it. We're talking about it. Ask, drop your ad in the chat. My ad? It's kind of weird. my name. What like is her ad? I like you know? get visible on the interwebs. <laughs> well, yeah, I want to also address, like, I know I addressed it in the chat, but Giannis, oh, um, Giannis was removed from our room because they weren't respecting other people in this space. We are open to discourse, but you got to respect the people in this space because we're all human, as that's the very topic of this conversation, the root of this conversation. Um, so, yeah, I just want to put that out there for the room. And I want to thank everyone for coming through today. Um, also thanking our team at Cloud Salon, Richard Thay, Sven Travis, the graphic design team, Richard Thay, Challen Chong, myself from Black Beyond, um, our program coordinator, Sam Morrison, and support from the design and technology program, John Sharp and Melanie Crean. And don't forget to join us next time with a, a conversation with design.io as they speak on their immersive and interaction design practice. practice. I wanted to get back in the vortex to sign off. <laughs> <laughs> yes, restore yourself, please. Restore it. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you for coming. Yeah, be safe. Wear your mask. <laughs> Ciao. Ooh, we still have people in here. Thank you.